beginning of 1966, the 60s are about to really become the 60s. President Lyndon Johnson is going to reaffirm America's commitment to the Vietnam War. And we just cannot now dishonor our word. We will not surrender. While in San Francisco, the Fillmore is preparing to host its first acid test. In Chicago, mayor and political boss Richard J. Daley is in the 10th of his 21 years in office, while the Chicago Freedom Movement the largest civil rights action outside of the South is about to culminate in a rally at Soldier Field, organized by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Now is the time to transform the bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man into a glowing daybreak of freedom and justice. The goal of the movement is to undo the racially restrictive housing policies and real estate covenants that white Chicagoans are using to confine the city's black population to the South and West sides. These same poor black neighborhoods are starting to have a global cultural reach. Thanks to its influence on the British invasion and the American folk scene, Chicago blues has become a touchstone for the blossoming counterculture despite the fact that black Chicagoans have been listening to it for over a decade. In 1964, the Rolling Stones cemented the bond between rock and Chicago blues with a pilgrimage to record a session at the influential chess label's in-house studio. The following year, the Stones introduced blues man Howlin' Wolf on the teeny bopper TV show, Shindig. Hey, hold a second. Howlin' Wolf was one of our greatest idols, so I think it's about time you shut up and we had Howlin' Wolf on stage. Yeah, Other veteran Southside blues singers like Muddy Waters, Buddy Guy, Memphis Slim, and Little Walter are suddenly finding lucrative new gigs on the city's wealthier north side. To white bohemians in Chicago and beyond, they're paragons of authenticity, brought up within arm's reach of America's first truly indigenous musical styles. Chess has picked up on the trend and is ingeniously marketing to their new audience with a series of compilations called The Real Folk Blues that are flying off record store shelves. White musicians from the north side and even out in the suburbs have started taking a swing at the blues, mixing in some of the psychedelia and hard rock sounds coming over from England at the tail end of the British invasion. Arguably the best white blues group in the city is the Butterfield Blues Band. You won't believe this, but he's perfect. I mean, I know everybody makes mistakes, but old Butterfield does not make mistakes playing blues on a harmonica. Mike Bloomfield, the group's featured guitarist, backed Dylan on his now infamous electric gig at Newport. Ever since an extremely heavy acid trip, Bloomfield's been obsessed with mixing the blues with Indian raga music, jazz, and psychedelic rock. The result is East West, a mix of electric blues and improvisational jamming that will kickstart the acid rock movement once it reaches the West Coast. In the white pop world, blues is everything right now, but black musicians in Chicago have already started exploring new sounds. Chicago has been home to a bustling jazz scene for decades, but the recently formed Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians is injecting it with a new revolutionary spirit. The first album to come out of the collective is called Sound. It's credited to Roscoe Mitchell, but features the core group that'll come to be known as the Art Ensemble of Chicago. <laughs> Sound is an instant landmark in the boundary-pushing free jazz scene. It's also the first step in making Chicago the seat of jazz's avant-garde, a position the AACM will help sustain for decades. Last year, The Impressions released what will be their best-known hit, People Get Ready. With its lush string arrangements and Curtis Mayfield's lyrics inspired by the Civil Rights Movement, it helped mark a new level of musical and political sophistication for soul music. The 1966 release of Riding High won't go down as one of the group's classics, but Mayfield's socially conscious lyrics and insistence on creative control 
are preparing Seoul for an artistic and political uprising that will culminate with the 1972 soundtrack to Superfly. Marshall Chess, son of Chess Records founder Leonard Chess, has the idea to blend smooth Chicago soul with the psychedelic pop sound currently storming the charts. Recruiting the rhythm section from an obscure local rock band called The Proper Strangers, and a former receptionist at Chess with a five-octave voice named Minnie Ripperton, he formed the Rotary Connection. Next year, they'll record a self-titled debut that'll go down as one of the earliest examples of psychedelic soul. Meanwhile, R&B veteran Syl Johnson is busy perfecting a harder-edged funk sound with the singles Straight Love No Chaser and She's Alright. Next year it'll pay off with the biggest hit of his career, Different Strokes. Although they'll never reach the same stature as Curtis Mayfield, decades from now, Johnson and the Rotary Connection will both see their music spread around the world in the hands of artists who haven't even been born yet. Their songs will provide some of the raw material for hip-hop's creation, sampled by N.W.A., The Tribe Called Quest, The Wu-Tang Clan, Jay-Z, Kanye West, and an entire future generation of global superstars. In half a century, the creative energy Chicago's generating in 1966 will still be shining.